continue our conversation. Have you ever wondered how we could be more like the churches in the Bible and have that sense of community and brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ? That's what we'll talk about today. How would you expect to find community while you intentionally withdraw from it at some point? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book, When the Church Was a Family, Recapturing Jesus' Vision for Authentic Christian Community by Joseph H. Hellerman. Last week, we talked about this book, and it's a big book. It's a difficult book to get through. He has some really good points, but how he believes that we need community more than ever and that the American church is failing us in a lot of ways partially because of our individualism in America, also because we're not a community and that we need to strive to do better. We're going to pick this conversation up talking about where Paul saw the church as a community and talk about more about what we can do to be a better community together. Specifically, Paul was obsessed with the church and how people need to treat each other like brothers and sisters in Christ. He told people not to sue their brothers, always talked about that relationship, that congregation, the image of us being brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't mistreat each other. We don't lead each other into sin. We don't corrupt each other. And he said that in this entire part, Paul used brother and sister 139 times, used father 63 times, talked about inheritance or being an heir 19 times, talked about us being sons or a child of God another 46 times. So this family image of the community of believers was very important to Paul. It's very important to Jesus. I don't know if it's the most important part of our faith. I think us having salvation is the most important part. But yes, being a part of this community comes right there next to it. Paul didn't get married, but his family were these churches that he was bringing up. His family, like Timothy, were there to be helpers when he needed it. The people who came to him when he was imprisoned, but the people that he was writing to, trying to make it better. And that church and that brothers and sisters in Christ not only means our family, who are believers in Christ, but it also means people of different genders, people of different races, people of different ethnicities, people who grew up in different cultures than we do. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is going to wipe away inside the family of Jesus. And he brings up the part in Galatians 3.28, there's no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female. That means that We are all part of God's family now. There's no rank. There's no levels. We are all equal in the face of Jesus. And he said, even the children, again, the children were supposed to come to him. So it's important for us to know that regardless of who we are, when we're in this church, in this family of believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ are all equal with us and are all loved and cherished by God, and are also all sinners just like we are. He says it's important for us to know, too, that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we talk about our Father, give us our daily bread. This is a prayer for the people. This is not a prayer about us, but it is us praying for a community. He also talks about how important it is that we serve this community. He talked a little bit about back in the time at the beginning of church, there was Tertullian, who was in the early second century. He was a Christian leader, and he tried to tell people inside of his church not to attend the theater. And if you became a Christian and you worked in the theater, that you had to quit because it's a occupation that compromises the community. It's not a good occupation to have. And so even he says to this point that if you have a job that is damaging to your church, 
This community is so important. You need to quit your job in order to be a good brother and sister in Christ. But do we ever think that we should, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, quit our job? The other interesting part that he talks about is the fact that this brotherhood, sisterhood, this Christian church was amazing in how it helped other people. It was not the Roman way. It was not even the Greek way to help people. If you were in prison, the Romans did not feed you, did not provide you medicine, did not take care of you. It was up to your family, your friends, your community to help you and feed you while you were in prison. They brought you food. They brought you a blanket if you needed it. And the Christians at that time were very impactful with their giving, helping people who were prisoners, consoling them talking to them, being with them, providing them with food, that it allowed the church to be such a standout in the culture because they were helping everybody. I even remember uh, someone talking about how it was very common to take babies. And if you didn't want the baby, uh, abortion was a big thing, but also just leaving the baby on a curb somewhere. And it wasn't like you were leaving the baby on the curb or in the woods because you hope someone would find it and take the baby, you meant the baby to die. It was not a hopeful gesture. It was, well, I can't deal with this baby, so we're just going to let the baby die, die of exposure. But the Christians at that time would take the babies and would raise the babies. And this idea of orphanages came out of the church. But the fact that they would help anybody that they would help each other, that they were a community of people that cared for themselves, cared for other people, meant something to other people in the Roman Empire, and that's what brought people to them. And he said, quote, the emperor's odd makers were dead wrong. Little did they know that even in Caesar's palace in Rome would turn into a church basilica in the not too distant future. How delightfully ironic. God must have some sense of humor. Think about that. And he talks about how Caesar Augustus put out the decree to destroy Jesus. And then years later, the head of the church was in that very same building. God is wonderful, isn't he? So this idea about people converting to Christianity, he says, wasn't just because of what Christians believed. You know, we think of conversion and talking to people about Jesus and evangelism as I'm going to say something that strikes a chord with you. But he says that the early church, people became Christians not only because of what they believed, but because of the way they behaved. They were outside of the Roman community. They were someone who was different, and everybody could see around them that they were different. And that's what made the big difference with people. They fed people. They pooled resources together. They helped the cold, the threatened, the homeless. And they are the ones who made an impact on society in general. Talks about how Justin Martyr talked about how they all pooled money together. It was such a contrast to people in the society that it made an impact to all the people around them. He gives a little bit of a conversation talking about how churches have a page on their website, what we believe, this doctrinal statement. He feels like it, it's not terrible that we have them, but the problem is, is that it doesn't go on to talk about how the church treats each other, what it thinks about our brothers and sisters in Christ and how we're a community. And I guess that's true. I mean, that's certainly what's important about it. I think that, you know, obviously the reason that the doctrinal statements come out in churches is because churches, you can't tell from the church what exactly it does believe, whether it believes in the Bible, whether it doesn't believe in the Bible. I remember a time that was coming out kind of in the 80s and 90s where you saw a lot of churches that were more like basketball leagues. You know, the idea of the church was it was, was a social club and lot less to do with church and God and the Bible and a lot more to do with basketball and babysitting and 
reading clubs and coffee and all those other things. And so that's why I wonder, too, that if you looked at some of those churches back in the 80s and 90s, they were a great community. And so they would probably even write a doctrinal statement that solely talked about what a great community they are. But their worship, their dedication to God was lacking. In my case, I go to a church that has a very strong doctrinal statement. And he's right. It doesn't say anything about the church community. Our goal is to make sure people know about Jesus. And we try very hard to make that happen. So if we were to analyze these two communities, would he almost say that the basketball league church was better than my church because it was really big into community? I don't know. You know, I'm not trying to say one's better than the other. I think he has a great point that we should have a mission statement. We should have an idea of how we're going to be as a community of believers. So I thought that was a worthwhile point. But when we look at churches, I think the reason that doctrine statements inside the church matter is because you don't really know what you're going to get at all anymore. Some churches are practically atheistic. Some churches are literalistic. I, you know, I think people want to know exactly where they're going with it. So it's important, too. And, of course, the church itself, you know, matters of how we relate to each other in fellowship. I heard of a church that denied communion to someone because they were talking badly about someone inside the church. I think that's a strong message. It says, you know, if you have a problem with your brother, you should put down your offering to God and go make it right first before giving your offering. That relationship inside the church is very important. But I think our relationship with the Bible and the scripture so that we understand what God wants of us is also really important. I think he has a problem in general with the fact that when we do become a part of the church, we are not automatically scooped up inside the community. I know when I became a Christian and was baptized into the church, there were certain classes for me, ways of getting involved, and I was very involved into the church and helping other people. But had I been baptized in a church that I thought wasn't following God's message the way I had then seen it, I would have changed church. I wouldn't have been a part of that community. He talked about the Moravians and how it was a German group that expected when they preached the word of God to people, they expected that you too then would join that church, that you are now a member of that church, which is neat. I think that's such a great idea. But what if that church was wrong? Should we still become a member of it? You know, I I hope you find a membership of a church somewhere, but does it have to be that first church that preached to you? Of course, the church talks very strongly about that. You know, the community he talks about that Yahweh was the God that delivered the people out of Egypt. You know, there's the conversation with Ruth and Naomi and your people will be my people. Obviously, people belonging to a community is incredibly important. And when we become converts of Christ, when we become brothers and sisters of Christ, joining a community is absolutely necessary and should be necessary for the rest of our life. I just get a little bit confused about what he's telling people when it comes to finding that community, being a member of a community, and the important aspects of the community that we find. And he admits that individuals are important, you know, that Jesus talks about the, the sheep, the hundred sheep, and how you go looking for the lost one in the field. We are individuals. We are members. And Paul talks about us being members of God's household. David felt very strongly about God knowing him. He knew you in your mother's womb, but he just thinks that we're so obsessed with that aspect of it and ignore the part where it's the we versus the I. And I think that's where he really brings his point out. And I think it's where it matters the most that we have to 
encourage each other, pray for each other, share what we have with each other. We must be in that spot. He talks about this concept of a barcode, and that comes from Dallas Willard's response. Quote, the real question, I think, is whether God would establish a barcode type arrangement at all. It is we who are in danger, in danger of missing the fullness life offers us. Can we seriously believe that God would establish a plan for us that essentially bypasses the awesome need of present human life and leaves human character untouched? Can we believe that the essence of Christian faith and salvation covers nothing but death and after? And so the idea is now that the Bible and the faith in Jesus has to tell us as much about how we live as as much as how we're going to die and what happens to us. That we are not just about this barcode so that we can get into God's club after we die, that we should be talking about what we do in our lives that matters the most, that we pray for each other, that we meet with each other, that we do all these things. And this is where, again, I think he's just going too hard, that we encourage people to confess their sins or say the sinner's prayer, which is new me, I hadn't heard that before that we share Christ and hope that that person joins God's group and gets that virtual barcode on them so they get to go to heaven. I think that's important. (laughs) But I think he's got the right point that that's where it begins. It's not where it ends. Then we are part of a community in the church. That's the part where it has to teach us to live and not just to die. He talks about a situation where he has a parishioner comes to his church and his church parishioner decides he's going to leave his wife, not for any biblical reasons. He just wants to move on. And so they followed the method that they did in the Bible, where they talked to him, they warned him, and they talked to eventually his Bible study group. But he was told to leave because he was living outside the biblical life. And I thought that was interesting and such a strong point. And I don't think churches do that much anymore. That not only is being in the community about praying for each other and caring for each other and sharing what we have, but it's also about holding what God tells us to do as a community and in keeping with that. And there is biblical principles involved in what happens when someone walks away from God, either by actions or by words, and what we do after that point. And I think, but he says in the end that he believes that there are four values that we should do as a part of our New Testament family. We share our stuff with one another. We share our hearts with one another. We stay, embrace the pain, and grow up with one another. So that means we're in it thick and thin. And that the family is more than me the wife, and the kids. It's about all of us. We are family together. And I believe that that's such a great message for us that we have to find that community. And again, I'm the worst of this, but he has such a great point that the church has to re-image itself in that community that not only goes to church, says, hey, on Sunday, hey, how you doing? How's the week? I hope you have a good week next week, which is pretty much how church is, and instead start being people together. There's a church that's out there, and I don't believe in the things that they believe, but they have a structure that I admire quite a bit, that, you know, there's obviously pastors and there's a deacon-like structure in there, but they know each other, and they know each other very well. And the church is broken down into these deacon-like structures so that someone brought this example that if someone goes to the church and says, hey, I'm coming up on hard times, could you help me with some money? The deacon representative in that family knows that person really well and can go and talk to the pastor and say, he has a gambling problem. We need to help his family for sure, but we need to get him into counseling for his gambling. I don't 
don't know that anyone knows in their church what their problems. I mean, I could be a raging drug addict. I don't think my church would know at all unless someone called my pastor and told them. But I don't think we know each other. And I don't think we know each other well enough to know what our problems and our struggles are anymore. I think that this church structure is trying to mimic exactly what it is that the disciples were seeing. And when I watch The Chosen, I think the part that I like the best about it is seeing that church structure and how much they cared for each other. And wow, wouldn't it be nice if we had a church that cared for us the way that I think they cared for each other? So I agree with them on that point, absolutely. But I think that maybe the problem has to be is maybe the church is too big. You know, maybe churches in general are too big. And that's why we don't know each other. We don't know what's going on with them. We don't know how they're doing in the pandemic. And we don't do anything more with them. And so is there some sort of problem, not even, I mean, obviously the problem with inside the church, but in some ways, isn't it the problem that maybe we need to be broken up into smaller chunks where we know each other? And these smaller chunks maybe report to a larger pastor in general. But maybe the, tr- the idea of house churches is better. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is here. But I think that he has some good ideas. He talks about a wisdom council that is there to provide advice and help people out with their struggles. I don't know that a pastor in a church of a couple hundred people could even possibly know what's going on with the parishioners anymore. It it may not even be something that can be done unless we start breaking down into smaller groups. And I think in the future podcast, because this one has been rather long on this topic, talking about what it means to dying to the self and what it is then to belong to Christ, but also to belong to the community in general. And I think that brings us back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and why he kept coming back. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer then said, it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brethren. And it's why he couldn't stay away. It's why he kept going back to Germany when everything tells you he should have just stayed away. And in the Bonhoeffer book by Eric Metaxas, and at the point of the book, towards the end, he talks about that Jesus became incarnate in the body, because we are not just souls, we are bodies, which means that we are not just to believe, but we are to act and to be a part of that Christian community in action, in the body, together. And that was just uh, such a great thought. So my challenge to you is think of one way that you could reach out to a Christian community you are in? Is there a way that you could follow those four principles of sharing your stuff, sharing your heart, sharing our pain and growing with one another, and to realize that the family is more than just our immediate family, but it is our brothers and sisters in Christ? Think about it a little bit. Try to take one step you could do to make that idea of Christian brotherhood, sisterhood, a reality. RE1, thanks so much for listening to this podcast. I know these two episodes were a lot of thinking and a lot of challenge to us in the American church. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com and remember to tell a friend. Hopefully we'll get this community growing and we'll have more conversations with all of you and pray for each other. And so that when we know, when we talk about giving our hearts, our material possessions to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can do so by taking small steps. <laughs>